Vascular tumors are the tumors that originate from vascular tissue, that means blood vessels and lymph vessels. Chiefly, they arise from endothelial cells. They can also arise from supporting or surrounding cells such as pericytes, smooth muscle cells, etc. Vascular tumors can be benign, locally invasive, they can metastasize infrequently and they can also be highly malignant. The order of this uh, malignancy can range from the most common that is the, the benign and the rarest types that are highly malignant. Now what will be the differences between benign and malignant vascular tumors? The benign vascular tumors are going to have vascular channels like these and they will be lined with endothelial cells which are going to be very well differentiated and also within these vascular channels will have blood cells and or lymph while the malignant types are going to have cytologic atypia that simply means that the cells are going to be atypical or not normal they will be highly proliferative that that is they will divide very rapidly and extensively and the vessels will not be well organized now depending upon their ability to um, metastasize and be malignant or benign we have divided them into being benign tumors and tumor-like conditions, those that are intermediate grade or borderline tumors and lastly we'll have the malignant tumors. So first we're going to discuss the benign tumors and tumor-like conditions. First of all we're going to have vascular ectasias. Now ectasias simply mean local dilations okay and when we say telangiectasia that will mean permanent dilation of pre-existing vessels okay first type of vascular ectasias are nevus flammeus. Now this is the characteristic classic birthmark. Okay? They are usually present on the head or neck region. They are light pink to deep purple in color and they are flat lesions and they regress on their own. One specific type of nevus flammeus is port wine stain which is known as port wine stain because they uh, resemble port wine. And what happens is that these um, stains, they grow in childhood, they thicken but they do not fade as compared to the previous ones which, which we said that they regress on their own. Now these port wine stains when they occur in the trigeminal nerve distribution, they can be associated with another syndrome called as Sturg Weber syndrome. Now this syndrome is uh, going to have port wine stains neurological abnormalities and eye abnormalities for example glaucoma so this is something to remember that if these port wine stains uh, occur in combination with neurological abnormalities eye abnormalities then we should suspect Sturg Weber syndrome next we have spider telangiectasias now these are going to look like these okay there is this is a central core and then we're going to have radial uh, dilated arteries or veins okay or arterioles so this central core will blanch with pressure that is if we put pressure on this it will lose its color okay and this will uh, the color of this whole um, telangiectasia will depend upon um, how close it is to the skin either it's uh, from an artery or a vein uh, etc so one thing to remember is that it is associated with hyper estrogenic states now if you remember the menstrual cycle uh, proliferative phase that is when the blood supply of the uterus is being increased that is under the action of estrogen as well estrogen can directly promote angiogenesis by endothelial cell proliferation so this is a point to remember spider telangiectasias are going to be associated with hyper estrogenic states such as pregnancy and cirrhosis is also found to have high estrogen even in males okay next we have hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia this is an autosomal dominant condition and the problem here is TGF beta signaling pathway which has a, a gene mutation problem. So we know that TGF beta is a peptide which controls uh, cellular proliferation and differentiation. So when there is a problem with that we are going to have uh, uncontrolled endothelial cell proliferation and then these telangiectasias are going to form. Now since this is hemorrhagic so one problem that we have is uh, first know that these are typically present on mucous membranes as well along with skin so uh, the mucous membranes uh, now the symptoms that we are going to have are going to uh, correlate to where the rupture is occurring okay so si since these are telangiectasias which are permanent dilations of pre-existing small vessels 
now these vessels will rupture and the blood will ooze out and the symptoms will uh, be different according to the site that this is occurring so let's say we have this rupture in the respiratory mucous membrane we're going to have hemoptysis in the urinary tract we're going to have hematuria and in the gi tract we're going to have blood in stools and um, also hematemesis so that really depends on where the rupture has occurred the next type of benign tumors are hemangiomas they're very very common they're made up of blood filled vessels and they account for seven percent of all benign tumors of infancy and childhood they will be present at birth they will grow and then regress eventually by themselves they're mostly present on the head and neck and rarely can be present internally and when present internally they can be in the liver spleen and kidneys there are four variants of hemangiomas capillary hemangiomas, juvenile hemangiomas, pyogenic granulomas and cavernous hemangiomas. Now if you had to remember two of these that would be capillary hemangiomas and cavernous hemangiomas. Capillary hemangiomas as the name states are thin walled capillaries with scant stroma or supporting tissue. They are most common unencapsulated tumors. The juvenile hemangiomas are the same things but uh, they are by birth so that this figure one in 200 births we can see that they are fairly common they are also known as uh, strawberry hemangiomas because for some reason they look like strawberries i'm not quite sure but you can google it and decide they grow rapidly but then they can fade by one to three years of life and in the majority of cases maximum uh, they'll stay for seven years and then fade by themselves they're also unencapsulated the third variant of hemangiomas are pyogenic granulomas. They are ulcerated polypoid that means resembling a polyp. This is the that variant and one thing to remember about this is that they are trauma related because after trauma there is going to be healing process right. So we also have granulation tissue uh, like substance in this type of granuloma as well. So. Uh, histologically if we look at this granuloma there will be proliferating capillaries with interspersed edema and inflammatory infiltrates that that all simply means that it is part of a repair process because it is trauma related one example of this type of granuloma is pregnancy tumor or granuloma gravidarum this is chiefly present uh, in the oral mucosa or on the fingers of pregnant women uh, they resemble red bloody shiny uh, mostly on fingers and in the oral mucosa as i said earlier and they most in most cases they need surgery to remove them lastly we have cavernous hemangiomas these are unencapsulated lesions and in contrast to capillary hemangiomas they are going to be larger in diameter that is one to two centimeter here capillary hemangiomas were one millimeter let me write it over here one millimeter or less so uh, they're going to be larger in diameter as compared to capillary hemangiomas they're present on the skin liver internal organs and also in the cns okay they will be locally destructive they do not regress generally as compared to the um, capillary hemangiomas and ju juvenile hemangiomas they can be associated with other complications such as thrombosis dystrophic calcification and other problems one important point to highlight here is that uh, cavernous hemangiomas in the cerebellum brainstem or eye area when they are associated with uh, similar lesions in the pancreas and liver that would be one hippel lindau disease now you will not probably remember this but if i say you won't then maybe you will the third type of benign vascular tumors are lymphangiomas they are benign lymphatic analogs of hemangiomas so they are the same things as hemangiomas but lymphatic analogs so there are two variants simple and cavernous the simple ones are going to be blister like blebs blisters are um, small vesicles filled with a fluid so they will resemble blisters and this blister will be filled with exudates and most commonly they occur in the head and neck region and axillary area okay while the second type the cavernous lymphangiomas they're also known as cystic hygromas they are going to be the analogs to cavernous hemangiomas they are not well encapsulated similarly in the case of cavernous hemangiomas they will commonly occur in neck axilla and retro peritoneally that is rare they will cause great gross deformity and the resection is very difficult 
The fourth type of benign tumor is glomus tumor or also known as glomangioma. So first uh, we'll see what a glomus body is. It is actually a specialized arteriovenous structure uh, which has a shunt between an artery and a vein directly there are no capillaries in between and they are then connect, uh, covered they are then covered by a connective tissue so they are chiefly present in the distal phalanges and their job is thermoregulation so when there is cold outside they are going to shunt blood away from the skin surface and when there is hot they are they are uh, going to increase the blood flow to uh, get rid of that heat so in glomus tumor or glomangioma what happens is that the tumor is going to arise from the smooth muscle cells of the glomus body so glomus body we know that is it is an arteriovenous structure so of course it has smooth muscles so the modified smooth muscles is going to give rise to this tumor one thing to remember is that it is very painful and it will occur in the distal phalanges and the, it it can also occur subungually that means below the nails morphologically they are going to be less than 1 cm aggregates nests or masses of specialized glomus cells associated with branching vascular channels that simply means that um, when we look at them under the microscope they are going to be nests or masses of the modified smooth muscles from which this tumor has arisen and uh, there will be also branching vascular channels along with them so that is the morphology So the last of the benign tumor like conditions is bacillary angiomatosis as the name states a bacillus is probably responsible for this and that is bartonella so bartonella family has two important members hensley and uh, quintana hensley is responsible for cat scratch disease and quintana is responsible for trench fever so what bartonella does is that it is going to attack an immunocompromised host probably an aids patient or someone who has received an organ transplant and is re receiving immunosuppression for it so anyhow what will happen is that without going into further detail um, eventually it is going to induce hypoxia inducible factor now we know that hypoxia is one reason that there should be an increase in angiogenesis or new vessel formation because that helps tissue to um, fight off hypoxia but in this case since there is no hypoxia but this IHIF alpha has been induced that will increase VEGF production that is vascular endothelium growth factor and that will result in angiogenesis which is the major problem because it is a vascular tumor so that will be because there is unneeded angiogenesis commonly it will be in the skin in the brain and in the bone when present on the skin it is uh, going to show as red papules, nodules and rounded subcutaneous masses. Since it is a bacterial infection, we can give antibiotics such as erythromycin to uh, deal with this problem. Now coming to the intermediate grade or borderline tumors, these are those that occur between the benign and the malignant ones. The first one is Kaposi's sarcoma, I believe that's how it is pronounced. The most important thing to remember about this is it is caused by human herpes virus 8, HHV8, which is also known as KSHV, that is Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. So this is both essential and causative. Okay, so when we have this virus, we have Kaposi sarcoma. It is most commonly um, going to occur in AIDS patients, immunocompromised patients, and also transplant associated Kaposi sarcoma is also there. Epidemiologically we can divide it into chronic or classic European KS lymphadenop lymphadenopath okay whatever this is or African or endemic KS transplant associated KS and AIDS associated KS. The first one the European type is going to be cutaneous mostly so there are red purple cutaneous plaques and nodules on the lower extremities mostly. The second one the lymphadenopathic one is going to occur in lymph nodes of course as the name states which I cannot pronounce and if it is visceral then there is a very high mortality rate and you don't want to get this. The last two are self-explanatory transplant associated because the immunosuppression um, will be there and AIDS also is immunodeficient so uh, 
that's the four types the pathogenesis of kaposi sarcoma is simple as i said that hhv8 is both necessary and sufficient to cause this disease what it does is that this virus is going to invade the endothelial cells and there are going to be two phases one is the lytic phase and the other is the latent phase as we know that viruses when they invade the uh, cell they cause it to lyse or burst open so this local destruction of cells is going to cause inflammation so lytic infection will recruit inflammatory cells and inflammatory cells you know will very well that they produce cytokines and there will be a local uh, proliferative milieu or that means that there will be environment for proliferation because all that uh, inflammatory stuff is going on the second phase the latent phase is that what kshv or hhv8 does is that it disrupts normal cell proliferation controls so like any other cancer causing agent it is going to uh, destroy all those processes or disrupt them and uh, pave the way for neoplasm formation so one way it does this is by preventing apoptosis by inhibiting p53 and thus this cell uh, this endothelial cell that it has invaded is going to have a growth advantage so what will happen is that it is going to grow and uh, proliferate uh, and survive and thrive and there will be no killing it because there is prevention of apoptosis so there will be a new plasm formation also uh, another way that this can be done is that there will be g protein encoding that is also done by virus this is uh, this g protein is encoded by this virus itself it will induce vegf as stated previously and that will also lead to endothelial cell growth and proliferation regarding the morphology of kaposi sarcoma there are three stages of the lesions one in the first stage we are going to see only patches then these patches are going to get raised into raised plaques and then uh, when they become nodules they are nodular lesions and these are the stages where they are distinctly neoplastic the clinical course is also going to vary widely according to what type of lesion is uh, present and the treatment uh, also depends upon the type uh, of the kaposi sarcoma so if the sarcoma is chiefly present on the skin what we can do is surgical resection also cryotherapy and if it is lymphadenop lymph yeah okay this one then uh, we can do radiation and chemo and if it is associated with transplant associated immunosuppression we can withdraw the immunosuppression and if it is associated with aids we are going to correct the aids with anti retroviral therapy and other aids uh, associated drugs the second type of the intermediate grade vascular tumors are hemangioendotheliomas now they have a wide spectrum from being benign well differentiated to being malignant they are very rare and they have a wide clinical course for example one of the tumors are epithelioid hemangioendothelioma it is a rare cancer so we'll just let it be Lastly we'll come to the malignant tumors. We have angiosarcomas and hemangiopericytomas. Now angiosarcomas are going to have a spectrum as well. So the spectrum will range from well differentiated hemangiosarcomas to more anaplastic forms. They are very aggressive and they metastasize readily. They can occur in the liver, in the breast, on the skin and uh, also in the soft tissues. those occurring in the liver that is hepatic angiosarcomas are associated with arsenic exposure pvc or thorotrast which is a radio contrast agent which is no longer used those occurring in the breast are usually after radical mastectomy that is when the whole of the breast tissue is removed along with the axillary lymph nodes they are thought to be arising from dilating lymphatic vessels known as lymphangiosarcoma in this case they can also be associated with radiation exposure now the lesions in this case are going to be early and late so the early lesions are small well demarcated red nodules which then evolve into large fleshy grayish white soft tissue masses and there is all degrees of differentiation when seen under the microscope we have hemangiopericytomas as the name states it is a tumor of pericytes now pericytes are they are cells of the microcirculation they wrap around the endothelial cells which line the capillaries and venules so they have uh, multiple functions such as controlling 
the blood flow through the capillaries the phagocytosis of cellular debris clearance and permeability of blood brain barrier as well so uh, that is the tumor of pericytes this type of tumor is usually seen in the lower extremities and also retroperitoneally and 50% of it will metastasize that's all about vascular tumors